Dear friends, my name is Yoni Gertner and I'm a violist with the Israel Philharmonic. My grandparents, Fred Felick and Ruth Gertner, both Holocaust survivors, made Aliyah following the Second World War and settled in the city of Hadera. As you may know, the Israel Philharmonic was born out of a reality deeply rooted in the events that took place in Europe of the 1930s. In addition to the establishment of a world-class orchestra in Eretz Israel, the lives of the Jewish musicians who came here in 1936 were ultimately saved by this historic event. This year, we chose to present our special story, the incredible feat of Bronislav Huberman, our founder, and some very personal and related stories of IPO members throughout the years. We will take you on a journey from 1936 to the present, beginning with a trailer from Josh Aronson's film, Orchestra of Exiles. Adolf Hitler came to power in January of 1933 and immediately began firing Jews from cultural institutions. Thousands of Jewish musicians found themselves out of work. Bronislav Huberman, the great violinist, did something few artists do. He stood up to tyranny, intolerance, and racism. Huberman had an inspiration that would change the cultural world. With Hitler firing the best musicians in Germany, it suddenly became clear to me that this was an extraordinary opportunity to give this wonderful audience in Palestine a first-class orchestra. This is when the Palestine Symphony began. He stepped out in front with all of his stardom and fame, used his music to organize something totally new, to show that the threat of Nazism would not destroy the cultural achievement of the Jewish people. Huberman was both a dreamer and a visionary. What he stood against took bravery. The Zionistic movement was really growing in those days, especially because of the rise of Nazism. Well, look at the situation in Central Europe and Germany in particular in 1935 and 1936. Nobody wanted his, his countrymen, his Jews. His solution was go to Palestine, find a new home. They came from Budapest, they'd been in Vienna, they'd been all over Europe. And here they get off the boat in Haifa, and I mean, there's nothing. <laughs> it's sand, a few buildings. Tel Aviv was really a desert before they came. I mean, can you imagine camels going on Fifth Avenue? I mean, that's how it felt. Then came the German Jews with suits and ties and funny hats, you know. Going to Palestine was no picnic. A lot of people described the heat and the bugs and the desert and the difficulty. It was a big deal coming to a land where the culture is almost non-existent, but everybody is very, very thirsty for it. They were so admired here that when they were walking, the bus stopped and gave them a lift. We created kind of a commune within the city. All the restaurants on the streets, the menu were in German. I think there was a lot of pain at what was happening in Europe and a lot of fear for loved ones that stayed behind. 73 musicians started the orchestra. 19 from Poland, 16 from Germany, 10 from Austria, four each from Hungary and Holland, and some were selected from among the local players in Palestine. 20 of these musicians had played first chair in their respective orchestras, and none expected to come to this desert outback, only to come down in musical status. You're talking about the best players in Europe, you know, and Jewish people, don't forget that. So I know better than you, and he knows better than him, and etc., 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 and the fights, it's coming immediately. The most famous musician in the world, Arturo Toscanini's public refusal to conduct in Nazi Germany reflected his unbending resistance to fascism. He volunteered to conduct the opening concerts of this new Palestine orchestra. And all over the world, it made a tremendous impression. The first concert was set for December 26th. Two months of rehearsals were to start November 1st under the baton of Maestro Steinberg. Torrential rains broke up rehearsals because of the terrible noise on the metal roof, and water dripped onto the musicians and their instruments. As things got worse in Europe, the musicians who were here, I think this pushed them harder. I think there was a sense of responsibility that they absolutely had to pass it forward. For the next 10 years, the Palestine Symphony toured throughout the Middle East. 
and they played for the Israeli troops during the 1948 War of Independence that ended with the world acknowledging the creation of the sovereign state of Israel. That day, the Palestine Symphony played Hatikva, the Hope, as the anthem of the state of Israel for the first time, and Ben-Gurion renamed Huberman Symphony the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. He played in one of the great orchestras of the world, in one piece. Now that's something which we never heard of and never been done again. By that time it was life or death. I'm honored to present former IPO violist Rachel Kam, whose retirement created my position in the orchestra. My name is Rachel Kam, formerly Paltieli, and I was a violist with the Israel Philharmonic from 1980 until 2016. I was born with the State of Israel in 1948 to Polish parents who were both survivors of the Holocaust. In a very young country where culture in general and classical music in particular were an important part of society comprised primarily of Eastern European refugees, I had the incredible fortune of being chosen to study the violin and later the viola with Dr. Zvi Rothenberg in Haifa. Zvi, who came to Palestine with a life-saving British certificate, was my teacher and mentor for eight years, and it is to him, among my teachers later on, that I owe my 35 years of musical career with the IPO. As you have seen in the excerpts from the film An Orchestra of Exiles, the story of the IPO is unique and extraordinary. No other orchestra in the world is as integrated with the history of its country as is the IPO. I am honored to share with you today some of my most meaningful experiences with this very special orchestra. When I first joined the orchestra in 1980, the language spoken by many musicians was German. The vast majority of the players came from countries like Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, Poland and Russia. They often told me about their first concert in Germany in 1971, a concert that took place after much heart-wrenching thought and debate and to which we have dedicated a special moment towards the end of this program. My own first visit to Germany was in 1984 and the orchestra's first stop was Munich. Arik Israeli, our principal violist at the time, invited me to join him for an authentic beer cellar experience as he loved beer almost as much as he loved the viola. Little did I know about the significance of where we were going, but as we sat down waiting for our beers while listening to a Bavaria band, I learned from Arik that it was in such a cellar that Hitler started the Nazi party. I couldn't fall asleep that night and realized that I simply would not be able to perform in front of a white-haired German audience, among which could be those who murdered my grandparents. The next morning, in rehearsal, I approached Maestro Meta, who told me that I was not alone and that additional orchestra members have come to him feeling as I did. Among them was Avraham Elamed, who as a young child saved his parents' life and his own by playing the violin to the commandants in the concentration camp they were sent to. In 1987, the orchestra was invited to play in Poland for the first time. I asked my mother to join and show me where she had grown up, but she adamantly refused, insisting that there was nothing left to see. In our concert in Warsaw, we played Hatikva, our national anthem, feeling extremely proud, while each and every one of us was crying. Emotions were especially in turmoil as we had just visited the ruins of the Jewish ghetto there and saw the orphanage of Janusz Korczak, 
who lovingly led his children to their execution. This historic tour to Poland was accompanied by French journalist Jacques Chancel and his team, who interviewed those members of the orchestra who had survived the Holocaust and those who were second generation to survivors. We were filmed on a train, making our way from Krakow to Auschwitz, and each member was asked to share his story. My time came as we were approaching the Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free, sign on Auschwitz gate, and I literally collapsed, unable to utter a word. It was on this tour that Chaim Yuval, our then principal oboe player, saw for the first time in his life the spot where his parents had been murdered. As a young child in Brussels in 1942, he returned home from school one day and heard from the neighbors that his parents had been taken to Auschwitz. Needless to say, he never saw them again. The idea of an orchestra, originally made up of musicians who fled the horrors of the Holocaust, touring and performing in countries where Jews were persecuted and murdered, is exceptional. For me and for my colleagues, the concerts in those places have always felt as a proclamation. We are here. Our heritage cannot be annihilated. Now it is time to let the music speak.
Before we part, I am honored to share with you the first-hand testimony of four legendary orchestra musicians, Chaim Taub, Yaakov Mishori, Mordechai Rechtman, and Gidon Steiner, who took part in the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra's first tour to Germany and were there to experience playing Hatikva as the last encore at the end of the concert in Berlin. For them, Meta's exceptional gesture is forever etched in their hearts. We shall now listen to Hatikva in Berlin in 1971, performed by Israel Philharmonic musicians, many of them Holocaust survivors, and conducted by Maestro Zubin Meta. To be followed by Hatikva played in Israel, conducted by Maestro Lav Shani, and performed by our Sabra musicians. I cannot think of a more appropriate conclusion to this special program. Thank you for being with us. This is the first time I came to Berlin, and after the concert, the concert was very good, the concert was very good. We came to Hadran, and Hadran, and the crowd just didn't give us to go. And the metal didn't know exactly what to do. הוא התייעץ עם הנגן הראשי, חיים טאוב. אז הוא בניגש עליי, אומר לי, עכשיו אנחנו הולכים לנגן את התקווה. הוא אמרתי לו, מה? התקווה בתור הדרן? מה פתאום? ובקהל לא ידעו מה זה. שומעים את המגינה היפה של התקווה, ולאט לאט פה, שם קמו כמה אנשים, ואז... לאט לאט כל הקהל נעמד. פה מנגנים התקווה בגרמניה, בגרמניה שלא אחרי הרבה זמן אחרי היטלר. זה אומר את התזמורת שהיו הרבה בה ניצולי שואה, ומנגנת את התקווה במרחק של פחות מחצי קילומטר מהרייכסטאג, ששם יצאו פקודות השמד. זה היה הרגע הגדול. בכיתי כמו ילד קטן. לא חושב שבכיתי פעם כל כך. כנור היה רטוב. זה היה אחד המרגיעים המרגשים ביותר שהיו לי ב... בהיותי כנר ראשי בפילהרמונית. ניגנתי ובגאווה. לא אשכח לו את זה. אי אפשר לשכוח את זה. אי אפשר. בשום אופן לשכוח את זה.